Greetings chess players, my name is Chris Torres. This is Daily Chess Musings. I haven't streamed in a while, so I thought um, since I'm teaching chess, um, you know, during most of the daytime hours, I would play one of my uh, training games on stream. So generally as a chess teacher, um, I do a lot of game review with my students. That would be 60% uh, maybe more, 70% of what we do. Um, I show them uh, games to teach them ideas that they're missing in their own games. And uh, then um, we, we also, of course, play some training games, simulated tournament experience. So I am going to go to my chess.com right now and accept a challenge from one of my students. So here we go. Um, and uh, let's see, um, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to start with A3, Anderson's opening, named after Adolf Anderson. If anybody tells you it's not a good opening, um, then they should have to explain why um, Paul Morphy uh, Failed to uh, Adolf Anderson beat Paul Morphy. All right, so bonsai cat, make your move, dude. Make your move, sir. Hopefully he's still here. I was a little slow getting things going. He's got. Uh, there we go. All right. So I'm playing it, I guess, a little bit like an English opening or a reverse Sicilian. Um, and it is playing like a reverse Sicilian now. And let's see. Normally in the Sicilian you would take here. And I will. Because I'm using a non-center pawn to capture a center pawn. And right here, we've got a lot of uh, different ideas that I could use. Let me make sure my windows look good. Uh, yeah, my windows do look good. Excellent. Um, I could take and bring their queen out. I could uh, hit their knight with like pawn e4, right? I mean, that's very tempting. Hit it with pawn e4. Um... In fact, I am going to do that. I'm going to hit it with pawn e4. So, threatening his knight, we'll see what he does. If he takes my knight, I'll, I'll take back with my b-pawn. Um, so, if he, if he does this, I'm going to take back with my b-pawn, preparing to play d4. He does not. He goes back. Interesting. Well, his knight has moved from the king's side to the queen's side. Um, so if, uh, if I castle king's side, which I'll probably end up doing, that, that bodes well for me. Also, with my pawn early on a3, it takes away any sort of bishop b4 pin. Um, but with his knight on b6, I can't play bishop c4. So I'm going to play knight f3. I have two knights developed and a pawn in the center. My opponent has one knight developed and a pawn in the center. Um, so many of you who followed me, followed me when I was broadcasting some high level top notch chess um, from a grandmaster and international master norm tournament. Um, I'm gonna be doing more of that soon. And I will add those to the uh, events on dailychessmusings.com. I need to update my event calendar there very shortly on dailychessmusings.com so you guys know what to expect. Hmm. 
Yeah, I've been uh, very, very busy. I know uh, I did a stream from the uh, Cal Chess. Ooh, he plays F6. Defending his pawn with, oops, that's a bad arrow, with F6. Um, very dangerous to do that. Very, very dangerous to do this. It opens up potential bad things, right? You create a bunch of weakness um, across here and a bunch of weakness that way when you when you move this pawn forward. Um, ben Feingold uh, strongly recommends against doing it almost always. So I'm taking my time. I'm deciding what to do with my light bishop. Um, it would like to be on, on this diagonal, but his knight is guarding that square. See, if I could play bishop c4 right now, then my opponent would not be able to castle. But I can't do it. Part of me says just get crazy tactical, pawn d4. Because once my pawn's up there on d4, then maybe I put my bishop on d3, and if I put my bishop on d3, it's not blocking the pawn on d2. So that could take care of that. I have to be careful with this particular student. I was showing him a uh, game um, from one of those uh, norm tournaments and a very tactical, beautiful game. And he was guessing like 90% of the, uh, the moves um, from two titled players in a very sharp and accurately played game. So uh, my student is way stronger than this rating would suggest. He doesn't play very much on chess.com. Yeah, I'm gonna play D4. So I have two pawns in the center and two knights developed. If he takes, I'm going to take back with my knight to avoid trading queens for the moment. So if he does this, I'm going to do that to avoid trading queens for the moment. My name is Chris Torres. Um, I am a correspondence chess master. I am a, a prominent chess teacher in the Northern California area. I am the editor for the Cal Chess Journal, which is the official uh, magazine of Northern California chess. And I... I'm the Cal Chess Scholastic Coordinator. So I'm doing a ton of stuff with uh, young people in Northern California. And if you know anything about our region, you know we, we are uh, one of the strongest areas for uh, youth chess in the world. Many of the players that uh, we get excited about watching, playing in uh, Reykjavik, Iceland, or Vekanzi, or any of these these big tournaments um, they got their start in Northern California I enjoy being a, a small part of that process helping whenever possible the next generation so if, when I do take back with my knight, I am in fact threatening to come out and say check. He can still block with g6, and this is what I'm looking at. So I'm looking at this with the idea of queen h5, but then he blocks with g6, and I don't have any... I may be on an open rank, but I don't have... Um, I would need something else. All right, so knight takes e5. Yeah, it's been a few a few uh, days since I uh, 
um, streamed for sure. I was recharging my batteries, doing uh, one or two rounds of five uh, titled games, analyzing them on the fly is exhausting work, exhausting work. But as I said during those uh, iconic broadcasts that um, I had been looking at these games anyways, but like I, you know, analyzing them and trying to explain the ideas of the uh, Grand Masters and International Masters on the fly, uh, exhausting, almost as tiring as playing. So I have two pieces developed in a pawn in the center. Two knights developed in a pawn in the center. And my student, my opponent, has one knight that's moved across to the, to the quote, wrong side of the board. Um, and also a weakness now on f7 because they scooted f6 forward. Yeah, I've actually uh, played uh, A3 against some very, very fine chess players um, and uh, have mixed, mixed results. But if I lose, it's, it's never the fault of the opening, it's the fault of the operator. I am operating the Anderson opening. Named after Adolf Anderson. Adolf Anderson was a very, very strong chess player. Um, and when Paul Morphy went to Europe to play the best chess players, uh, Howard Staunton ducked the challenge. He would not just sit down one-on-one -on -one and play a match against Morphy, because um, he knew he'd be embarrassed. So he did uh, a couple of these uh, team matches where he had a friend and Morphy had a friend, but it wasn't just the two of them. That was the closest they ever got to playing. Um, Anderson who was Howard Staunton's uh, main opponent from the time period. You know, very, very strong chess player. He was a mathematician. His father died at a young age. And uh, Adolf Anderson uh, um, hur hurried up and uh, finished his uh, um, higher level math studies so he could support his mom and his sister. And while he was teaching at the university in Berlin, um, he ran into some guys at this uh, chess club there and uh, they thought he was very talented and before you know it he was beating them and they were just like blown away and then he was like writing the magazine for them and uh, they got their money together and sent him to this tournament in uh, in london and he did really well tied for first place and split the prize so then he was kind of wealthy and able to play uh, play chess he could support support himself from uh, chess um, so, you know, years later, then uh, Paul Morphy comes to Europe, and uh, uh, Howard Stott won't play him, but Adolf Anderson was on uh, winter break from the university and had uh, Paul Morphy come and play him in Germany, and uh, Morphy got really, really sick. They had to, uh, he was running high fevers. He almost died. Um, and so from his near deathbed, from his sickbed, Paul Morphy played Adolf Anderson. And Anderson used 1A3 <clears throat> to start that match and beat Morphy. And then uh, afterwards, uh, Morphy won the rest of the games. I have to wonder, though, the, you know, Anderson proved to himself that he could beat Morphy. And then I think, you know, he, he was, by all accounts, a kind man. I think he was looking at the um, condition of his opponent and had to have sympathy. And so I don't think he was playing his best... Uh, his best chess. Hmm. So that is, oh, and then uh, of course Paul Morphy beats him. Everybody recognizes Paul Morphy as the uh, world champion, but Morphy was ready to be a lawyer. He was just kind of putting it off until he was old enough to practice law in the state of Louisiana. So he comes back um, 
to the United States after the Civil War and uh, was a uh, a very poor lawyer by all by all accounts and didn't play chess. So Anderson was basically um, considered to be the strongest player in the world again because Morphy quit playing chess. little bit of chess history. Chess has a lot of really good stories. All right, so my student's bishop is controlling a lot of the important light squares that I might like to use. This this bishop may only be up one, uh, one rank, but it's taking a lot of the light squares from me. Now again, I can throw in a check, and then he can block. But then, then what? I don't have a, a good follow-up. I create a little bit more weakness over there by the king. But I think I would prefer to play that check when I have something else that could help out. So I'm really thinking about bishop d3, because that could potentially give me a bishop um, threat on g6 plus prepare me to castle so I'm just gotta I gotta double check everything especially because that leaves this knight undefended for the moment So I've used a fair amount of my time already. 10 minutes um, of my 30. I'm going to play bishop d3. It's a little dangerous because this is undefended. see what my opponent does. Hmm. Let's see if we have any. We got two viewers. Excellent. If you're watching the show, um, you can ask questions or say hi. I have the chat window open to my side. Again, my name is Chris Torres. I am a correspondence chess master and a longtime uh, chess teacher. And I'm just doing a spur of the moment broadcast here to uh, make sure that, um, number one, I'd be playing a training game against this particular student anyways. And number two, I haven't, I haven't done a, a stream in a while, so serves two purposes. This is my second of three lessons today. So a three lesson day is kind of a semi, semi busy day for me. Um, other days I do more. Some days I do a little bit less. But I'm very fortunate. I always feel very fortunate to be able to do what I do. Um, because I, I really enjoy the game of chess and the history of chess and um, inspiring another generation of players. It's like any um, occupation, though. If you want to be successful, you're going to have to work very, very hard and put a lot of energy. Um, you can see a lot of that energy just by looking at the last, you know, just checking out the dailychessmusings.com look at the blog you'll see what i've been doing and like i said i will i will be uh, updating the um hmm. the uh 
events calendar with my uh, upcoming broadcast schedule for those wonderful Mission 360 Bay Area Chess IMGM Norm tournaments. There's uh, three more FIDE rated tournaments that I will be broadcasting. Plus, uh, I'm talking, I'm going to try and arrange to broadcast the uh, Dinker um, Championship for uh, Northern California. That's the uh, top high school players competing in the Barber, the top junior high players. They get to go and, uh, and uh, represent Northern California at the U.S. Open um, in the Dinker and the Barber tournaments. And so uh, in Northern California, what we do is instead of appointing a player, we have them compete for that right. And uh, so it's, it's very high level. Um, and uh, I will try and bring you that as well. So with those things, I mean, we're, we're probably looking at at least uh, 15, 20 broadcasts um, in, the, in the coming uh, month, month and a half of uh, high level exciting important chest action from my home region of northern california so i have three pieces developed um, and a pawn in the center my opponent only has two developed no pawn in the center i'm ready to castle i was afraid he might do that um, it develops a piece and it threatens my piece So what I had been pondering while I was talking to you guys is if I put my knight here, if he does take, then I take back with my pawn. And with my pawn sitting here, it creates a big potential for the QH5 check, because then G6 doesn't work anymore. So this is what I've been considering. He developed with a threat against my knight. I don't want to take because it would give his bishop a very powerful diagonal. So that isn't what I want to do. Instead, I want to move my knight closer to my opponent's king. So I step in closer. Yeah, you can check out uh, dailychessmusings.com. What started out as a blog has turned, it's blossomed in a community, into a community. Um, the Daily Chess Musings Club on chess.com, we've got 2,000 plus members in it. It's a wonderful, wonderful community, and I'm going to be getting way, I'm going to have an active schedule for that too. Getting ready to announce a whole bunch of events for that club is free to join. Um, in addition, in addition to that, um, you can uh, check out the uh, all the videos on Daily Chess Musings on YouTube, the YouTube channel. Of course, follow uh, follow us on uh, Twitch. See when I'm doing live broadcasts. And uh, um, make sure you check out the dailychessmusings.com regularly. Going to be announcing some summer camps and some really exciting uh, events. Got the Eid Foundation tournament coming up too. May 8th, I believe. Sunday, May 8th. Anybody who's uh, who's watched, who's been a fan of this, you know, uh, daily chess musings for a while, knows my good friend James Ede and his foundation, Fide Master James Ede. Here we go. All right. So what am I doing? I'm threatening Queen H5 check because I've moved this pawn up there now. If there's a check that comes down the E file, I could block with Bishop E3. Is what I'm thinking. And um, very open center, right? A very open center means a lot of tactics. And here's the, the interesting part. Remember that A3 move I kicked it off with? 
a3 is controlling a very important square for a lot of those tactics b4 so hardly a wasted move i usually can make uh, make use of a3 having been played already Yep. I hope uh, hope everybody out there is having a uh, a wonderful uh, Tuesday afternoon or evening where you are. The weather has been uh, just wonderful in uh, Northern California. However, the other day it was interesting. I was listening to the um, San Francisco Giants play the Cleveland Guardians. They're now the Guardians, no longer the Indians. The Guardians. It's a good name change. Um, and the game time temperature in Cleveland was 35 degrees. Whoa, that's frigid. That's frigid temperatures for baseball. In fact, it was the coldest Giants um, game time temperature ever recorded. So I'm glad that I live in nice, nice Northern California. Home of a vibrant chess scene and lots of great uh, chess clubs, historic chess clubs. The Mechanics Institute in San Francisco is the oldest chess club in the United States, continuously running. The Koltanowski, the Colty Club in Campbell, named after George Koltanowski. The uh, great um, grandmaster and chess advocate. He would do a, a, a tour on the chessboard. Okay, so... Uh, what my student's done is move his queen forward, which means if I bring my queen out, we could have a trade of queens. It also means that he's probably, so if I, if I, this, this actually works pretty well, I think, because I wouldn't want to trade queens. And additionally, now he can castle queenside. Hmm. All right, so I, I need to really take my time here again. I've already got my queen side pawn storm started with a3. I think castling is going to be best. I castle. I think he's going to castle queen side because otherwise rookie one's coming real fast. He castles queen side. Now I need to get the rest of my pieces involved, but check it out. Oh no. Look at this. He's threatening d3 twice. Well that's not good. I don't want I don't want all of that. Um, so if I move my queen, he's gonna win the bishop. If I move the bishop, we trade queens and rooks. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So let's see. Yeah, I should have seen this, but I was, you know, talking about this and that. I did see it, but I, I just failed to uh, register the uh, that he has two attackers on d3. So. I think I like that my bishop is supporting this pawn on f5. I like that a lot. 
So I'm, I'm thinking bishop c2 makes a lot of sense here. And then we probably just trade off a lot of stuff. Yep, I think that's probably what's going to happen. There's also bishop b5. But then he might take on f5. So bishop c2 it is. I have the bishop pair for this endgame, but he's got three pawns on two, which is a pass pawn far away from my king. We're castled on opposite sides, which is interesting for this kind of uh, end game we're setting up. Should be interesting if you're joining us. Uh, my name is Chris Torres. I'm a correspondence chess master. I started the game with uh, Anderson's opening. It's a fine opening. Adolf Anderson used it to uh, defeat Paul Morphy in the first game of their match in 1858. December 1858, I want to say. Late December 1858. And now it looks like we're going to be heading to an end game where I have a bishop pair versus my opponent's uh, bishop knight kind of situation. If I can trade one of the knights off, that even makes that uh, more beneficial for me. Fighting for the open files is going to be paramount. Um, and my opponent's other rook is still not unified. So he does not trade. He does not trade. So I was getting ready for this um, endgame. And he does not. He does not trade. Okay, so bishop is actively placed, threatening a check capture on h2. I have enough defenders on my queen to take care of this problem. I need to get my bishop in the game, but then his rooks are unified. Neither of us have a center pawn now, because my pawn moved out of the center. Bishop e3 looks very good. I'm going to go ahead and play it. I am a little low on time, right? So I have to play a little bit faster now. And then I'm going to get my queen out if there's no trade of queens. Possibly to uh, f3. Although f3 is a problem because his knight could go to e5 and threaten it. So I haven't decided yet where my queen is going to go. e2 is not wonderful either because of the rook um, h to e8 pinning the bishop to the queen. I knew this particular student would give me a good challenge. His tactics keep amazing me. He's ready to have, you know, a breakthrough as far as his uh, tournament chess goes. Okay, he's got all his pieces activated before I have all my pieces activated. Hmm. He's got a rook in each of the open files. I have a queen. So the question, a couple of them. All right, so there, there's the uh, interesting ideas, right? Let me, let me throw out a few interesting ideas, just for fun. Um, there's this bishop b3 with the idea of bishop to e6, which pins the queen to the king, forcing a trade of rook for bishop. That's interesting. I have uh, queen to h5. 
is interesting. I would not take this pawn, however, because that would allow my opponent to swing their rook over to the h file, doubling up on h2. Queen f3 does not work so well, neither does queen g4, because then my opponent can move his knight to e5. If I play bishop b3, it doesn't actually work, because queen takes f5. Okay, so I have to defend f5 first, before I try bishop b3. Hey, Arcane Doctrine, how's my favorite mod? The moderator is in the house. All right, so queen h5 does support f5, which means with f5 supported, I could try and get my bishop to go in there. So I'm leaning more toward. Yeah, they gotta, gotta behave. It's a, it's a family-friendly broadcast. Created by a family-friendly coach. I do. You know, Sunday I had fun because uh, one of one of the chess dads. He's like, hey, after you do your lesson with my boys, I teach both his boys back to back. If there's any time, then uh, I'd like some some uh, chess too. And uh, there was, we had fun. All right, so queen to h5. I'm going to do a lot more of those streams, yes. So Mission 360 has already announced three more events. Um, I'm going to add them to dailychessmusings.com's calendar. And uh, in addition, I'm going to cover the uh, Danker tournament and Barber tournament for uh, Northern California as well. Um, so the Danker is the best high school player. How we decided is have a chess tournament. Um, and then uh, we send them to the U.S. Open to represent Northern California. The Barber is the best uh, middle school aged player. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to broadcast those as well. So between the Mission 360 IMGM Norm tournaments in San Jose, the FIDE hybrid match um, upcoming against Bulgaria, um, and the uh, California versus Bulgaria, and then uh, the Danker and the Barber, yeah, I'm going to be busy. So, yep. Today I um, am just teaching a lot of lessons, and uh, what I do is do a lot of game review with my students and show them, uh, show them classic examples to help them understand ideas that maybe they're missing in their own games. Um, and then I'm going to do this uh, bishop circle move. So my bishop's threatening to come. Two. This is my plan, bishop e6. So I needed to support f5 first. Um, now my opponent could throw in g6, and then things get a little, a little crazy hectic, right? Yeah, going to be doing a lot of high-level chess broadcasts. Those took a lot of energy, too. I was talking about it earlier. I mean, you know, watching and explaining five boards of Grandmaster, International Master, FIDE Master level chess on the fly took a lot of energy. So, yeah, I've been a little, little absent. I'm going to do some other uh, broadcasts, too. I mean, if there's, if there's, uh, you know... There's never dead time so much for Northern California chess. But if there is, I could always, like, you know, do a broadcast of any tournament that's not getting a, a lot of international attention, um, but deserves it. 
And there are plenty of those happening all the time. So yeah, I'm going to do a lot more. Uh, collaborating with other streamers. Yeah, it's on the to-do list. I need to do that as well. There's that G6 move. Wow. Okay. So I got to analyze my checks, captures, and threats very carefully here. Checks, captures, threats. I mean, I, I'm threatening the bishop e6, but the problem is then my opponent's going to take my queen first. I take his with check, but then he gets my bishop, right? If I do anything here, I don't have that support point anymore. And um, my opponent can open up the H file. It's 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 just very very troublesome. If I if I if I do this, then I'm gonna lose because this is played, and then this is double attack. So instead. And then, of course, the time situation. I'm, you know, I've used uh, two thirds of my time already for this. I'm thinking Queen H3, because then if uh, if like things really start not going my way, um, first of all, I'm still supporting, and I have the chance for Bishop E6 still. Second of all, possibly a trade of queens to bail out if uh, my opponent gets too much pressure, because this this bishop is dangerous down here. So I'm going to play queen h3. Make sense to you guys at home? I hope so. That was the first, like, critical move, I think. Um, if I mess that up, I lose. So that was my first critical test of this game. There's going to be more real soon. All right. So there's the capture. Of course I was expecting that. And then uh, I had a couple thoughts here. A couple interesting, interesting thoughts. <sighs> Again, I got to analyze the checks, captures, and threats very carefully. These are the critical moves. Checks, captures, and threats. The, um, you know, queen's sitting on the same diagonal with the opponent's king. So if this pawn were to scoot forward, then I, I put a bishop on e6. Um, of course, you know, bishop c2 threatens that directly right now. Bishop c2 threatens it directly right now. I don't have to wait for him to push it forward necessarily. Rook a to d1 would pin his bishop to the queen, but sort of only because he has the... I'm really thinking bishop c2. The problem with bishop c2, though, is then I don't have support for my knight to d5 for a moment. But I think it's worth it. The other problem with bishop c2 is then I'm... He can put another rook. Oh, man. I think I'm going to play... Rook a to d1 first. Pinning the bishop. So moving a piece I haven't used yet. We want to try and touch all the pieces. Touch all the pieces. Now I have touched them all, right? Because I touched this one when I castled queen obviously bishop knight now yeah so i've used all my pieces so is my opponent he just actually moved his rook over to move it back
And as the time ticks down, you know, uh, the likelihood of making a miscalculation in these critical positions is higher. A moment ago, I was I was starting to like Black's position, you know. They had access to all their pieces first in the open files and stuff. But I think my uh, Queen H5, and then this um, exchange of pawns, double isolating and isolating, and then uh, the Queen dropping back to H3. Now I'm I'm starting to to feel more comfortable with my own position. Of course, that's what you want. Yeah, that pin on his bishop on d6 could prove to be very useful. I may still, at some point, decide to play bishop c2. Welcome to the show if you're if you're joining. Uh, my name is Chris Torres. I am a correspondence chess master, a long time chess teacher in Northern California. I'm the scholastic chess coordinator for Northern California, which basically means I'm involved in all things youth chess um, in our region. And I'm the editor for the Cal Chess Journal, the official magazine of Northern California, the official chess magazine, um, and uh, many other things on top of that. This uh, Daily Chess Musings, the, the main hub for this uh, blog-turned-community is dailychessmusings.com. There you'll find information about all the things that I'm up to, including, uh, check out the blog, thousands, up. Oh, there goes that rook back again. Well, I'm not going to take, I mean, you know, maybe he's hoping I take this pawn. I'm not going to take that pawn. I'm going to play bishop c2. So the idea is bishop takes f5, pinning the queen to the king. Targeting these these pawns, these isolated pawns. Um, the uh, and and i'm going to schedule a bunch of events for our uh, chess club on uh, chess.com daily chess musings chess club we've got 2000 members um, i've been busy with you know uh, spring scholastic championships kind of stuff but uh, yeah uh, this weekend's the high school championships and then uh, i'm back to a very busy broadcast schedule of high level events um, imgm norm tournaments danker qualifiers high level chess events i'm going to be broadcasting a lot of and also doing a lot of fun events so i'm going to kind of do um for the next two months you're going to see a combination of a lot of high level events where i try and break down the ideas behind top players and their moves and uh, then uh, you're going to see a whole bunch of fun events in our club um, broadcast as well. It's going to kind of be hopefully split kind of even. And then we're getting into uh, uh, summer camp time. Uh, my uh, free online summer camps are some of the most popular things I do. Um, sometimes having, you know, a thousand something students sign up even. And uh, I'll be streaming those and doing lessons and uh, those will be those will be scheduled very, very soon. After I finish with this game, then uh, regardless of who wins, um, I'm going to go sit down with my student and go back through, and we'll learn as much as we can from it. Um, we'll hook up in a private Zoom. Um, but this is a, a, a nice training game. you got to do these occasionally with your students. It's important. Simulated tournament. He does not hear what I'm thinking. I don't 
give him any help or advice. Okay, so queen comes back. That means there's no threat of the pin anymore, right? So there's no threat of the pin, but there's there's other big threats for sure. Other big threats for sure. But I get a, a free check, and I intend to take it. Check. It's a free check. And now this bishop is one of the more scary pieces on the board. I've taken a material advantage and I've weakened. Um, I, I've left my opponent with two isolated pawns. I do not have any isolated pawns. Um, so I'm going to play. Am I? Am I? Take, take a moment and really think, Chris. I think knight b5 makes a lot of sense because it forces, forces some issues. Some possible trades. So, yep, we're going to do it. Knight b5. It's a little bit of a dangerous move because uh, the, the knight on b5 doesn't have any defenders for the moment. <sighs> That's why I took a, a, a couple few extra moments there. I would like to trade that knight for the bishop. Um, because then I have a bishop pair versus a pair of knights in an open end game. Who's going to be better? So I can play rook takes check. Let's see, checks, captures, threats. I could play bishop takes g6, followed by bishop to d7. That's interesting. Checks, captures, threats. Must think hard. I have I have a little bit more time than my, my student. Six minutes versus his three. I like queen takes h7 is a very dangerous move, but it's it's interesting because if I trade queens, um, I'm going to go with rook takes d8 check, and look at that. Uh, he was expecting that. He played right away. Right away, indeed. Now, my bishop is guarding, but I'm, I got this problem down here on b2, so I'm thinking of bringing my knight back, actually, to c3. So I tried to exchange my knight for his bishop, it didn't work. But I exchanged one pair of rooks. See, my opponent has, I, I can't take h7, I would like to take h7, but it, it could open up a very dangerous situation. Now that he only has one rook, um, it's less dangerous. He's been waiting for me to take on h7. Um, but I want to do it when it's not suicidal. He's got two and a half minutes. I've got five, so I'm maintaining a two to two to one time advantage in uh, in actual minutes. He's got the open D file, so my little exercise there. I mean, I tried to trade. Uh, all right, so he's threatening all this again. I think I'm actually going to 
bring my bishop down to c1. I think I will. Because otherwise, bishop takes, knight, pawn takes, and then he takes on a3. There's a lot of, lot of opportunities here for me to mess things up. I still have the bishop pair for this endgame. My plan is to win one more pawn, trade pieces, and uh, just win the endgame. Wow. Wow. Bring in the heat. My opponent is bringing the heat big time here. This knight has moved into checking distance. I want to take h7 now, but I need to I need to be very careful about it cuz this bishop is very problematic for me. Do I play f4 now? That gets that takes care of the problem actually for a moment. Let's see. F4 is actually playable now because his bishop with the knight being there can't can't do what it wants to do. Okay. So f4 I'm playing. Uh, once I get this bishop blocked from h2, then I can take on h7 safely. I gotta be like really careful about these weird things though, like bishop takes, rook takes. I didn't I didn't analyze it, but it looks like I've got things safe. My knight on c3 is defending e2. He's so close to having a game-winning tactic. So very close. I think I play queen takes knight because then his bishop has to move. But his bishop says check, so I don't. I I think I, I need to get rid of this 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 bishop right now. Okay. Get rid of the bishop. I'm still I'm threatening the knight twice. I think I get a fork here. Seems like. Oh, no. But if I take... Oh, I can take because my rook goes backwards. Okay. Yeah, rook goes backwards. Um, and then I can take here. Because his rook can't take without back rank mate. And... Let's see. Yeah, we just got to pile things on the best way possible. I'm thinking queen c3, then bishop f4, because he's going to play f6 when I play queen c3, then bishop f4. Okay. Nope, he, he went he went to, to threaten down there. Um, and then I say check. And then take, he can say check, that's fine. And he got a little little too low on time. There's no stalemate here. No stalemate. Um, so we say check. King's got to move over and then checkmate with the rook. Yeah. Um, good game, sir. Good game. Uh, it was nice having the uh, 
the broadcast with my uh, streaming buddies again. Nice seeing you, Arcane Doctrine. I'm going to put up a busy schedule within a day or two on dailychessmusings.com. I'll come back and do another stream after I've done that to talk about all the upcoming broadcasts, including more GMIM level chess from Northern California live. So that'll be that'll be fun. Um, I will see you guys later. Farewell, Arcane Doctrine. Thank you again for uh, moderating. Every every. Uh, Every captain needs a first mate, right? I'm steering the ship, and it's nice that you're you're engaged in the chat, making sure it all stays family friendly and nothing goes off the rails. All right, I'll see everybody uh, probably Thursday night. I want to say. All right, so long, everybody.